Hey, Simon. Yeah. Come here. Sit down. Do you know? Do you know what today is? What is today? It's our hundredth episode. Oh yeah, it's our hundredth episode. Why are we? Cheers. Why are you? Pro- what's happening? Why Cheers. are we recording? Cheers. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> so confused. Oh, that was so reckless seeing over the equipment. So I thought you've got me lots of gifts throughout the years of the podcast. <laughs> what? To get you a gift. <laughs> I was going to call him a Colin the Caterpillar. It's not Slinky Caterpillar. Tesco's version. Slinky Caterpillar cake. There you go. And a wee whiskey. Shut up. Is that for me? Yeah. You've got me beers and whiskeys, and I ungratefully accepted them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. You can put that in your decanter in your new home setup. I, I Once will, you finish that expensive one. <laughs> I, I will have to drink what I've got. But yes, thank you. Oh, well, look at that. Delightful. So now but we're, not, we're not supposed <laughs> to be recording for another two minutes. <laughs> well, let's now get into the episode. What? The goal isn't to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Welcome to Perspective, a podcast for wedding creators, where we sit down, often with a special guest, and talk about our many years of experience in the wedding industry so you can learn from us and grow your wedding business. And who are we? Well, I am Simon, and this is Greg Alicious. Together we are Cinemate Films, Scottish-based wedding filmmakers who love nothing more than drinking coffee, sometimes beer, and talking with others about the stuff that we love doing. This episode is, of course, sponsored by With Jack. So if you need insurance, give them a listen. Give them a listen. Give them a, a, a follow. Go have a look at their products. Actually, it's very good at our job. However, Greg, who are we talking to today? We are talking to Ryan Brown from Forged in the North. Hello, Ryan. How Hello. are you? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you guys? Good, thank you. Very, very well. And Ryan... Just in case you don't know, this is actually our 100th episode of the podcast. So uh, it was a little bit of a, a surprise to me this morning when when Greg um, reminded me of such a fact that this is the 100th episode and he bought me a whiskey and it was all very nice. So thank you for being our 100th guest. Yeah, well, congrats, guys. That's amazing. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's very cool. to, uh, to that's, that's a big milestone. Yeah. Yeah. It is, and I just happen to forget. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so why don't you introduce yourself a bit for our listeners? Yeah, so yeah, my name is Ryan Brown. I um, co-founded uh, the wedding studio Forge in the North with my wife, Heidi. Um, we started shooting weddings about 12, 13 years ago, um, and it wasn't until maybe four years that we into that that we kind of created Forge in the North and uh, I'm sure we'll get into more details on that. But, um, but yeah, I'm a photographer and wedding filmmaker. We, uh, both Heidi and I actually did both of those things right from the very first wedding. So we don't really view ourselves as just photographers that, that picked up video or, or vice versa. It was sort of an all in thing all at once. And, um, yeah, we've been, uh, we've been at it for, for, like I said, 12, 13 years and, have now expanded the team into uh, into uh, more people. We have a second studio now, and um, uh, just just loving it actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and where is Heidi today? Heidi is uh, she's she's on um, kid duty right now. Okay. Uh, we uh, we uh, we're hoping that she could join us, but we uh, we had a uh, a, a nanny uh, scheduling um, uh, mix up. So unfortunately, uh, I'm just uh, flying solo today. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, we both have kids, so completely yeah. understand. <laughs> um, Sometimes that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So where whereabouts are you based then? Yeah, so we're based in uh, in New York. Uh, we actually just moved outside of New York City, but we were in Brooklyn for uh, about 13 years. 
And uh, most of our shooters are, are in the New York City area. We have one upstate. Um, but yeah, we're pretty much, we, we kind of consider ourselves based in New York City. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, is New York City a, a good place to, to live? Do you enjoy it? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the city, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an expensive place to live. Um, and, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily easy to, uh, raise a family there. There's obviously space constraints and, mm. and costs and things associated with that. But, um, you know, it's, it's certainly an amazing place to start a business. Um, okay. there's just so many people to connect to mm. and it, especially in the wedding industry. I mean, you just, the density of New York city, just, you have so many people getting married in so many places that are, mm within a subway ride or just a short drive. So, um, so we have, uh, you know, kind of rode along with that, uh, kind of energy that New York has. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, now we're outside of the city where we have a little more space with our kids, but, uh, still kind of consider ourselves based in, in New York city. Mm -hmm. We've, uh, we've spoken to a few podcast guests, uh, from the States and some of them have mentioned that the community aspect of running a business is kind of lacking. It, have you found that because you are, you know, in and around a busy city that that's kind of helped with, um, with building a community? Well, it's, there's, there's so many people here that it is sometimes I think a bit hard to find your little group. Right. Okay. Like for instance, just one, one random New York city photography, second shooters group is like many thousands of people big. <laughs> um, and so like, if you post a date, if I posted a date in there, I would get 40 to 50 people wanting to second shoot. And so it, it is hard to kind of like feel like it's a community when the, when the groups are so big mm -hmm. now, like having been, in this industry for a little bit, we've, we kind of have our small little group of friends that we have our own kind of Facebook group and community and get togethers is maybe like 40 of us or so. Um, and we all kind of compete for the same clients too, which is interesting. <laughs> I mean, not uh -huh. exactly, but for the most part, we're sort of all in that same, um, uh, kind of market, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so that I would say that is like what we have found. Um, and there's a couple other groups that are kind of more like uh, country wide, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one's more of like a New York specific group. And um, it's, it, I mean, I, I don't know what you guys have there. It's, it's just like for us having that, that group is just so instrumental um, getting through COVID uh, you know, crazy clients that you want to ask questions about and kind of like field out, uh, other opinions on. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I mean, we've actually just in May had kind of an emergency. Heidi got really sick one week in May. Um, there's sort of uh, multiple factors to that, uh, that are, I won't bore you with, but basically she couldn't shoot this wedding with me. Mm -hmm. Um, we were supposed to do a photo and video job. And we just immediately posted to that group and people are jumping in, helping us find people. Um, that's just kind of like a really comforting thing to have, right? Knowing that you're kind of covered if, if something were to be a, a real emergency, like, like what happened to us. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, I'd say it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It probably takes a few years to get into it here. Um, maybe not mm -hmm. quite as like a small community as, some other um, maybe smaller countries where it's like just easier to connect with people right away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We've probably got that kind of advantage because we are a small country with, yeah. Uh, although we are city based. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a couple of really good groups around that are either Scotland focused or even just UK based. And it's just, as you said, it was great support through the last couple of years and you can find second shooters and, yeah, it's, it's a good yeah. community around Scotland in particular, I'd say. Yeah. You mentioned the word, uh, yeah. well, compete. You said you're competing for the same clients. How, how, yeah. how is that for business? Do you find that that's beneficial to kind of keep your eye on the ball? Um, or is it something that you have to kind of be wary of in the back of your mind? Um, do you mean in terms of our friend group or just in general? 
Ooh. Uh, well, you were talking about your friend group at the time. Yeah. But I yeah. suppose, well, yeah, your friend group, friend group. Yeah. I mean, I think with the friend group, everyone, everyone kind of understands it's somewhat fair game. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, like someone will post, um, well, we always, every day there's posts of like, hey, uh, you know, October 12th, Brooklyn Winery, like who, like anyone available kind of thing. Sometimes there's a budget attached. Occasionally someone will chime in on that and just say, hey, I, I'm actually talking to this couple. Um, I wouldn't mind like an extra recommendation. And so that kind of happens too. Um, so people sort of use their best judgment on how to like help each other out. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, there's, I think there's enough varying price points even within our group, even though I said we sort of do compete, there is still sort of a wide range of, there's, there's kind of a higher end, more luxury market. Mm-hmm. And I would call it more of a middle budget uh, kind of group of people. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, it's hard to know exactly how everyone's business is doing. I mean, everyone seems to be doing pretty okay. Like we're all full time doing it. Uh, I, don't, yeah. I haven't heard of anyone like leaving or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for us, we've, for, for many years now, we've had, uh, we've been very lucky in that, um, uh, we get a, a lot of inquiries. And so like, um, it's not ever really too much of a, of a big deal. If we lose out on one, there's usually one right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've, we've worked pretty hard over the years to, to get to that point where we have a lot of, uh, lead generation. So, um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think for us, it's, it's not a big deal. Maybe, maybe a little trickier with other people in the group, but yeah. yeah. Okay. So tell me forged in the North, how, how did that become a, a collective and how do you manage, uh, um, uh, a, a varying set of creative individuals under the one brand. Yeah. So it's when we first started, um, it was just Heidi and I, and, um, soon into it, we, um, and it's, it's hard. And I actually don't remember exactly why we did this, but soon into it, we kind of thought, Hey, let's, let's see if we can add other team members, see what that would be like. Um, we reached out to just people we knew, friends that we knew that were in the industry. We called it Ryan and Heidi Studio. And um, this is um, uh, us. And we had uh, two photo shooters and two video shooters. They each had their own companies. So I, it, was, it was set up very differently than Forge of the North is set up now, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. But um, we were all just kind of friends. And we were, we were able to kind of share our leads with them. Um, I've always felt that it's much easier to book someone else other than you if they are under your umbrella rather than just a referral. Yeah. Okay. Um, sort of like kind of keeping it in house. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a few years into that we had fun, but we all kind of knew, Hey, we either all need to abandon our own companies and create something totally brand new um, and be really truly become a studio or a collective uh-huh. Or we just sort of need to part ways. And I think everyone was headed in a slightly different direction with what they wanted to do, which was totally cool. They're, they are still our close friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we kind of decided to just part ways. And, and Heidi and I just kind of started fresh. Um, that's when we created Forge in the North. The reason we rebranded was we wanted to eventually build out a studio and did not want our names attached to it. Yeah, um, okay. It was always sort of a goal of ours from the very beginning that we wanted to build out a team of shooters that we all felt ownership in the company and that when uh, potential couples came to us, um, they didn't feel like if they didn't get Ryan and Heidi, they were getting some type of like second rate shooter or some beginner shooter. Yeah. So that was sort of the impetus of it all. And Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that was a kind of like stroke of genius. That was just randomly what we decided to do. And it worked out. Um, we very soon after that added one photo shooter and one video shooter. And that's Paul and Bennett. And they're still with us. Yeah. So they've been with us almost 10 years. And um, Forge in the North was really started so that everyone on the team would be full time Forge in the North. There's no side business. Um, there's no alternate career. Like this is their bread and butter. Mm-hmm. Um, of course they do other things with, with their, with their photography work and their, and their video work. But this is definitely for, uh, for all of us, this is sort of our, 
our, you know, bread and butter and what keeps us most busy. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of how it all formed, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. Managing a group of, uh, individuals like that. I do, cause I, I've spoken to a number of people who have had a kind of similar idea and the question always, like they always talk to us because obviously we're a duo uh, under the one brand and they always talk about, um, like how, how, how do you structure the business? How, how do you like pay each other? Like who's, who's the secretary and, and all that kind of stuff. So if you don't mind for the people who are maybe thinking about managing or expanding into a group, like how, how would you tell them to like financially manage individuals or, or what roles would you imagine um, giving to people yeah. right off the bat? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's a good question. There's, there's a lot of ways to slice this and uh, I can kind of get into a little bit of what we did with our, our sister company, which is called after it all, which is also photo and video work. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on that in a second, but with forge in the North, because we always had the ambition to build a team of people that were not transient, but that would be with us for a long time, which has worked out. Paul, like I said, Paul and Ben have been with us almost 10 years. And, um, uh, because that was important to us, I, we did not prioritize making money off of them in the beginning. And to an extent, we still really don't. Um, the theory at the time was the more weddings we shoot, the more referrals we'll have from planners, from, you know, bridesmaids and groomsmen and yeah. venues and just more interfacing with people and other businesses. Mm. And so the thought was, let's build that out and not worry about making a ton of money off of our shooters. And the sort of other effect of that is, of course, the shooters are getting paid more and are much more likely to stay. So I had to make it financially, uh, you know, incentivized for them to want to stay with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so when we first started out, um, we took a thousand dollar flat cut off of all of our bookings for those people and they keep the rest. So all the gravy, all the overtime hours, any extra edits, all that kind of stuff, they keep that, not us. And so, um, and so I think, you know, and that ended up being on average a 10 to 20% cut mm-hmm. depending on what kind of package was booked. Yeah. I have, that is the lowest I've ever heard of. And I've been doing this for a while. I've not heard of anyone taking as low as like a 10% cut to do what we're doing, which is the lead generation the, usually the initial contact or phone call, um, all of the uh, like invoicing, contract, payment, file delivery, um, insurance, all of that stuff. Um, essentially, the shooter is responsible for, you know, obviously some calls leading up and, and showing up and shooting and then the editing. Yeah. And uh, we do we do everything else. So um, we feel like that worked for the people that we had involved. Um mm-hmm. But I would say if like one piece of, uh, you know, sort of the, the key, the key takeaway here was, I would say finding the right people is by far the hardest part of this whole thing. Um, figuring out how much you pay them, what do you do? What do I do? That all kind of falls in into place depending on who you have on your team. Some, cause like some people may want to, um, use your studio as sort of a, a launching off point. And it's obviously good to make sure that's clear in the beginning that, you know, Hey, this is probably like a two or three year relationship. Yeah. Um, some people are like Paul and Ben didn't want to run their own business. They had no interest in running their own studio. Mm. They liked kind of being attached to our brand and creating this like team that we had. And so that was great. Cause like, that was what we wanted. Those are the types of people we wanted to find. Mm-hmm. And, um, we've since expanded to two other people on top of that. And so, um, we're all sort of on that same page where this is like, this is our main thing. And, um, yeah, finding those people are 
by far that is that is the most difficult thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll jump gears real quick to our sister company after it all, which yeah. we had we we kind of mold this idea over for a couple of years before we launched it in 2019. Um, essentially, we had um, an excess of leads. We had way too many leads coming in that we knew what to do with. Mm-hmm. And we didn't really want to raise our pricing too much because we'd be pricing ourselves out of the types of clients and weddings we want to shoot. Yep. And we'd be only taking a small fraction of those. It'd be, it'd be a little bit more of a struggle to get everyone booked full. Yeah. Um, and so we had too many leads. And then we also had the issue of um, it we may have been too expensive for certain clients or we were already booked up, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, we had this idea, let's create a studio that's lower price with more shooters for availability to cover those leads. So those are the two main goals of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we created this company called After It All. And we have three photographers over there um, and one video shooter. Mm -hmm. And that is structured a little differently. Those people we know from the get-go, they are a bit more transient. For instance, one of our shooters just finished school and she's a full-time architect now. And so she's toning back to like five to 10 weddings a year, just sort of a moonlight job. And that that's happy. She's happy. We're happy with that. That's totally fine by us. Um, uh, We've had a couple shooters uh, already have to leave because they've moved to different places in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, that's just how it's set up with that. The shooter gets paid an hourly rate. And we do everything else, um, okay. editing, all the, we do as much as possible. And mm-hmm. so it's sort of the inverse of Fortune North where they get paid a set rate, we take the rest, whatever else is added on, you know, all that, those extras. Um, and so by doing that, we increase our profit margin with a, with a studio that charges less money, which is, uh, was the, the tricky part of how we were trying to set this up is how do we charge less and make more? And that's kind of how that, uh, all played out. Mm-hmm. Am I right in saying after all dot co is the right website? Yes. Cool. Yep. Just for people who want to check check out, compare the work. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's really cool. I will give a, a look to that later. Do you, did you have any concerns while starting that up that you might cannibalize some of your own leads? So if, if somebody inquires with yeah. Forge in the North and then finds out, oh, you know, after it all exists, I'll just go a bit cheaper. Did you have any concerns about that? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, there was, it was, it was, a, it was a little scary at first for sure. Like we, we had such a good thing going with Forge in the North. There was, mm-hmm. uh, like I said, it was like me, Heidi, Paul and Ben at that point. And we had a studio manager, Kate and, um, and things were going really well. So there was an element of like, why are we deviating from this great thing that we have? Um, but, um, having after it all allowed us to do, allows us to do other things like put more time and energy into other kind of marketing efforts for both studios. Mm -hmm. So we felt like there was an advantage there to, um, to sort of like everyone gets elevated, um, by making this move. But for the most part, people don't find out about after it all until they've already inquired with Forge the North and maybe either we're all unavailable or we're too expensive. So if those right. two um, variables are met, then uh, that's when they kind of hear about after it all. Now, since we've been going for like four years, now we are sort of kind of generating after it all is generating its own leads, not mm-hmm. too many, but that that is sort of happening and, and that's okay. That's still a very small amount compared to Forge in the North kind of funneling those leads into after it all. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, so far it's been, it's been great. And it's actually been, um, it's been going so well that we've expanded the Forge in the North theme. So we have enough work to actually go bigger on Forge in the North. Yeah. And um, that, you know, we'll see kind of how that plays out. I think we're, we feel pretty maxed out. We have 10 shooters and a studio manager and a couple editors. That's a lot of people to manage. Yeah. Yeah, That's man. just yeah. a lot of, a lot of e- emailing and, and me being on the phone nonstop. And um, so I feel a little bit maxed out that it's, yep. it's sort of like, that's, a, that seems like a sweet spot unless we've made really big shifts in how the business is structured. But 
Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think like so far it's been, it's been good. And, um, what we found is that there are just so many more people, so many more couples that have the budget that fits after it all versus Forge and North, even though I don't yeah. think Forge and North is even like that expensive or like into that luxury market. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still just the bulk of people getting married. There's so many people in New York getting married. The bulk of them have, I would call like a, a more like low to mid size budget for photo and video work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our, our long time listeners will know that we on a much smaller scale, so not with 10 shooters or anything, we just started a sister company and the idea was to go for that low to mid range market as well and try and yeah. you know, just send out second shooters to shoot it on their own. They actually yeah. edited it as well, but eventually we sort of got to the point where it was like, these are good enough that why don't we just move the shooters to our team <laughs> and just shoot more weddings under Cinemate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. And they were all just freelance though. Like they weren't on, contracts or anything right. so it wasn't a proper studio setup it was just here yeah. and there when we did it but yeah, yeah. there's definitely a lot of things to consider and manage and i can't yes. imagine the amount of admin and, you guys must have oh god yeah yeah it's it's a lot of admin um uh that we have a studio like i said we have a studio shooter that helps uh helps with that um but um t- to your point we we have had um, so Benjamin on the fortune is a little confusing. We have two Ben's on fortune North, uh, <laughs> but one is Bennett. One's Benjamin. Um, the Benjamin started with after it all. And, um, he very quickly outgrew that and his right. partner, Tina, who is still on, um, after it all probably will come up to a fortune North and they may actually become like a, a video duo together on the fortune of the North team because she's also outgrowing after it all, um, yeah. you know, it like, like there is that worry because like her work is so good that a lot of couples will look at the Forge the North video work and look at her video work and be like, yeah. Hey, this, this is awesome. Like, and yeah. we can't, we can't just keep like raising the price on after it all yeah. then it becomes, there's no difference. So, um, so yeah, it is, it, it is a little bit tricky, um, with, um, yeah, and, and just find, like like I said, it, finding the right people to fit these roles is really the is really the challenge. Um, yeah. I, would, I, I, I would say. Am I right in saying that Tina would? I mean, if Tina leaves, would there be another? Because I'm just having a look at the names. You got Adam, Jennifer, Ali, Tina. Yeah, three of them are photo, and Tina is cinema. If yeah. Tina moves, are you going to have to fill out the the filmmaker <laughs> role? Well, I would like to, um, but, um, you know, Heidi, like, yeah, so we have a couple, there's a couple feelers out there right now. Oh, and interesting. Okay. Well, like, I think this has been just a nice advantage we've had of being in the industry for so long and having kind of a recognizable name in the New York market is mm. um, there are people that talk to us and kind of feed us people. Oh, Hey, like I, you know, this person might be a good fit. And of course there's 10 of us doing it. So we all have our feelers out and everyone's constantly yeah. looking to see, Oh, well, this might, this person might be a good fit. And, um, so those things are very helpful. Um, when we first started after it all, we literally made like a job posting and it was a little bit more just like a cold call out there to people to apply. Um, and that's how it first started. But, mm. um, yeah, with video, um, so the the one difference is with After It All, or, or I guess similarity rather, is that our, Tina does edit her own work. We don't handle the video editing. We just don't have the capacity to do to do that on top of yeah. our own video editing and all the other things we have going on. So it's structured a little bit more similarly to the Forge of the North video shooters, and um, and so uh, we'd have to find someone that can that can do those things and. Um, yeah, it's it's very difficult. My, I, I would argue maybe trickier with video than photo. Um, yeah, to find the right person that fits fits the brand and is you know mm-hmm. trustworthy and can handle the clients and all that kind of jazz. Yeah, yeah. So going back to before Forge the North, it was just yourself and Heidi. You said that you started off from get go as like a hybrid team doing photo and video. Yeah. So what was your thinking behind doing that? And then how, how do you sort of 
uh, even up until the current day, how do you seamlessly combine the two services within sort of one business? Yeah, when we first started, um, I don't know what we were thinking. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I think we just we had we had a couple of nice cameras after. We, so we both went to architecture uh, school and worked as architects for a little bit in those first couple of years of doing photography. And um, you know, Heidi, uh, I told I told Heidi like uh, when I had moved to New York and was working as an architect, I told her to buy a camera and like, hey, let's just have fun with this and see what happens. Um, you know, when you're first, uh, you guys probably remember when your first jobs, you will just do anything you can. I mean, you don't, you just have no idea what's, what's normal. And so it's like, Oh, they need photo and video. Yeah, I'll do it. Like I got it, you know, and they basically had no budget. These were like kind of friends of ours who were getting married. And, um, and so we just dove right in. Um, and, um, uh, that led, you know, that, that ended up being for, for sort of a, like a first wedding, um, ended up turning out pretty all right. And that kind of led to another one. And, uh, of course this isn't work that we would like really show today, but like, um, it was enough to get, get the ball rolling. And, um, and I would say, you know, now, um, it's it, looking back on it. I mean, it's, I'm really glad we did that because it's extremely beneficial to be a photo and video duo and um, also be able to do both. Uh, this is something that we definitely market to our clients and, and talk to them about is like, um, Hey, like for Heidi and I, like we're both doing both. We've always been that way. And um, by the way, that's a, pretty unique thing just to let you know that's not going to be a normal thing you're going to find that's uh, pretty rare um i i don't really know anyone that does it like this so there's a lot of photo and video duos typically you have like a one on photo one on video um for us we're switching back and forth throughout the day there's a few different ways we handle that but it definitely makes like the wedding day go a lot smoother when mm -hmm. maybe i'm on video kind of like stuck in a spot where i, I can't i can't move Heidi's going to check, you know, our field recorder to make sure levels are good, right? Or she's off on the side getting photos and then sniping a quick little, um, you know, insert shot or a secondary angle or whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of like efficiencies with that that make it uh, very helpful. And occasionally we will split up like guys getting ready, girls getting ready, and each of us go to um, different locations. I'll shoot photo and video she'll shoot photo and video. There's a couple ways, <laughs> different ways we do this. Heidi will sometimes actually shoot two cameras at once. It's quite impressive. I don't do that. Oh, nice. Um, but she'll, she'll hold a monopod and ra be racking focus and, and shooting photos. Um, oh. Usually I'm, I'm kind of switching back and forth. Obviously it's helpful that most cameras are, are most wedding cam wedding cameras are pretty hybrid focused. Mm. You know, there's, there's, you can kind of do both. Um, even though we, we do shoot a lot of stills work on a GFX, which we don't, uh, shoot video on, but, um, yeah, I would say kind of like to answer your question, uh, we definitely, it definitely comes in handy on wedding days and this is something we use as a selling point to our clients for sure. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. What, so Greg actually manages, uh, I was guessing the company, but me, he manages me uh, as part of the business, and uh, it's something that I'm not particularly good at. I take the lead shooter role in the wedding. He manages more of the business side of the business. How do you manage an array of people? Like, what what software do you use? What like even down to the I'm, I don't know why I'm asking this question. You might be better to ask this question, but like what kind of financial software do you keep records mm -hmm. on? Uh, what sort of like uh, group organization software platforms do you use to manage your team? Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what's your go-to software and stuff? It's, uh, it's changed over the years, but where we've mm -hmm. been for at least a few years, three, four years now, um, is we use for um, invoicing, contract, and client facing as a sort of a CRM. We use a, a company called Bloom, uh, Bloom.io. Um, they're 
kind of, I would say they're just out of sort of the startup phase. They're, they're newer. They're definitely lesser known. Back uh, maybe four years ago, I did a deep dive on like five different platforms and it just really could not find one that really ticked all the boxes. We started on the old legacy shoot queue system, which I don't know if you guys are familiar okay. with shoot queue. Yeah. Um, shockingly, the, this old clunky shoot queue system, which isn't really, it doesn't, it's not used anymore. They have a new version that are, that's totally separate from the old, um, actually had a lot of studio functionality that I found hard. Like, like there were things in like Dubsado, um, that couldn't be done, uh, in, in that couldn't be done in Dubsado compared to this old shoe queue system. So I was finding like some of these new snazzy ones that I was just like, I, I can't believe this can't be done. But anyway, <laughs> we, um, uh, became kind of close with the uh, founder of Bloom and kind of took this risk in, in adopting it. But what was nice was we kind of had his ear on how to develop it a little bit. So we were, we're, we're definitely considered like power users on this platform. We're shooting 150 to 200 weddings a year. And so that's just a lot of stuff happening in that, mm-hmm. in that app. And so we're able to give a lot of feedback and he's implemented uh, a lot of uh, features based on things that we've needed. So that's really nice when you like need something very specifically done and they actually just like build it for you. Mm. Um, and so it's not like fully built out to be a, a studio platform. However, there's sort of like some easy workarounds that, that we've used um, to do that. For paying our, our uh, shooters, we use a, a payroll service called Gusto. It's like a mm-hmm. online electronic payroll um, service. And um, yeah, it's easy to like pay contractors, second shooters. You can do employees. You can do retirement plans, benefits, all things through there. Um, those are the main things. And that way, obviously, like Gmail for all of our emailing. Um, mm-hmm. But that is, uh, that is pretty much it. Pick time is our gallery, fo- uh, photo gallery uh, software. Yeah. And um, all of our videos are hosted on Vimeo, which is pretty standard too. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Very cool. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, self-promotion here, Ryan. So bear with me. If you've enjoyed this conversation, uh, you can follow us on YouTube at uh, youtube.com forward slash at Perspective by Cinema. Hit that subscribe button and uh, ring that bell to get notified. However, how, how do you mean... How do you maintain the sort of consistent style throughout your sort of portfolio when you're managing so many different creatives? Like there's different teams going out yeah. each day. How does the Forge in the North portfolio and Instagram stay consistent? Yeah, that that's that's something we think we've thought about a lot over the years. I mean, when we first started Forge in the North in twenty. 2014, 2014, I think it was, um, Paul and Ben were very new to weddings. Um, we essentially were their launching off point. Right. And so I would say Heidi and I found our sort of voice and our style around 2014, 2015, 2016. That's when we were really, um, kind of just, just in, in artist mode, you know, just really pursuing like different ideas and trying new things and, um, figuring out what the heck we like and what is comfortable for us to, to shoot. Um, I say because of that, it was sort of a trickle down to Paul and Ben and that, uh, we became their main inspiration at that time, I would say. And so, so there was an element of, you know, we were creating sort of the, um, the sort of, you know, landmark, uh, pieces in our portfolio. And that was, that was sort of a reference, um, for, for them. So, um, now of course it's been almost 10 years and they each have their own voice. Paul, uh, Paul is a better photographer than, than Heidi and I don't, don't tell our clients this, but (laughs) Paul has surpassed us. Okay. Uh So Paul's definitely, and, and honestly, each one of our shooters have their own little niche that they've created that is kind of different than Heidi and I, but I would say there's still an overall, there's some, some kind of overall 
uh, motif in our work that I would say that it ties us together just enough um, uh, with still variations that make certain clients say, oh, like I definitely want, you know, I, we love Ryan and Heidi's video work, but we want Paul to do the photo or Heidi to do photo and Ben to do video, whatever the case is. Mm. Um, and, but that, that is a tricky thing is like, how far do you push that? We actually just had a conversation with one of our shooters and he was worried that his, what he wanted to do with his work was just going to go too far in another direction. Um, but we, I actually loved his ideas and what he wanted to do. And I was like, just, you know, go for it. I think it's okay that we have different styles. Um, there's a, there, like I said, there's an overall sort of cohesiveness to the work. And I think that comes through and maybe just, uh, it, it's kind of in how we think, see things. There's something about the storytelling that ties it together. I would imagine there's probably a lot of similarities in the client interaction and, and our sort of relationship with couples on the day of mm -hmm. that are uh, very similar to each other. But um, it's a great question. I mean, it's something we're constantly thinking about and evolving on. I don't have a definitive answer there. Are, like <laughs> a, kind of going back to how you can pay your shooters and set, set things up. There's probably a dozen different ways you can do it. And I know maybe some studios have like, people with very distinct voices and they're, they're very different styles and other studios where it's just sort of um, monotone. It's just like one thing. Yeah. Um, with after it all, because we do all the editing, I would say that becomes the cohesive element in that work is the, the look of the images tends to be um, similar in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then each shooter kind of has their own little, their own little story or their own little way of doing it. Um, yeah. But another thing that I tell our clients, especially with after all shooters is it's not just the work. It's also like the, the shooter's temperament. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, are they a soft spoken person? For instance, Jen is very quiet and observant. So I'm, I may not necessarily recommend her to, like a, a giant Greek wedding that's going to be, you know, 300 people and, and super loud and, 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 and very intense and energetic. She probably thrives in more of like that, you know, small wedding elopement kind of, uh, job. So, uh, there's, there's sort of that as well that we we're constantly, you know, dealing with. Yeah. You kind of, alluded to this um a moment ago when you're when you're talking about your other shooter but my question was going to be about how you keep a group of creative individuals creatively motivated and to keep them pushing the the quality of your work yeah obviously you mentioned that you gave free reign for creative expression, which I thought yeah. was great. Are there any other ways that you manage and help push your team to stay motivated, especially when it gets really busy and everyone's just like yeah. editing all the time or just like slogging through a heavy season? I would say there are two two big things that I try to push or think about most when it comes to this. So one is making sure the weddings and the couples that we work with don't piss us off and don't make this job harder than it should be. Yeah. And that has limited us slightly on where we can go with pricing. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a worthwhile trade-off. I find that like a lot of people get burnt down out in this industry because they're not working with couples they enjoy working with. For for me, m almost all of my couples I vibe with, we have a fun time, and it makes me love this job because of that. It's just the best. I feel lucky every wedding I get to go to. Um, I think a lot of people get burnt out because they're with couples that um, you know, uh, didn't like their work to begin with. They want them to shoot like something else or, or the personalities don't mesh or there's a lot of variables to that. But so finding good clients for our shooters to work with, that's, that's sort of like what I can do, um, to help them. The other 
factor to this is all of us shoot other types of work. And so I'm always trying to push them into uh, doing other things. Paul um, does a lot of fine artwork. He does sculpture work. He does illustration work. Um, uh, like a link to his like personal portfolios, I think right on our info page there, you can go check that out. Wild, amazing, incredible, talented guy. And um, so he has that whole side of his um, artist brain working on things while he's shooting weddings. And it comes through in his, his wedding work. He has cool. certain shots that I'm just like, I, you are the only person in the world that could have gotten that shot. Like it was just so him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ben, both Ben's who do video, um, they shoot other types of work, documentary work, some like commercial um, content type work. Um, for Heidi and I, like I've, I used to do a lot of commercial directing work. I've shifted now to a lot more, uh, commercial aerial photography work. Um, Heidi does a lot of fashion and beauty editorial photo work. Um, there's also just random little photo video commercial jobs we do on the side. So yeah, all in all, we're all sort of trying to, um, expand our 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 scope a little bit Mm -hmm. and let those things inform our wedding work which i you know i tell our couples a lot is like we not all of us just do weddings we're also doing other work and here's why that's a good thing it's a good Mm -hmm. thing because we're not getting bogged down with the same thing all the time we're always having like a fresh look on things or getting inspired by other types of work um you know, this is like something I tell wedding shooters all the time is like, stop looking at wedding work and start looking elsewhere. This is, Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously I did not invent this, uh, this, uh, piece of advice. This is a a well-known thing, but, um, create, keeping that creative diet, very diverse. And, um, and, uh, you know, if you're looking to, uh, you know, how how can I photograph a couple differently than I've ever thought? Well, maybe you should watch, um, you know, Lost in Translation. Maybe there's something in that kind of obscure romance story that you could pull from, or there's visuals in all sorts of things. I mean, even Apple commercials, right? I mean, these, these are some of the best cinematographers. Um, a buddy of mine is a creative director who does a lot of Apple work. He just had Hoyt Van Hoytema shoot his commercial. Okay. So that's the guy who just shot, um, who just shot Oppenheimer and who works with Christopher Nolan. So these, these are things that we can all take inspiration from or editing. If you want to get a masterclass in editing, a 30 second spot is, I mean, how do you tell a story in 30 seconds? I'm not talking about most commercials. Of course, most commercials are kind of garbage, but I'm just sort of like, as an example, the, the inspiration is everywhere. It's not just movies and it's not just, other big fashion photographers or something like that. So, um, yeah, anyway, that, that's sort of the line of thinking we have with, with our shooters and trying to, I guess, just pushing them and keep, keep, keeping them chasing their dreams and other aspects other than weddings. Yeah. I, I love the fact that you, that you kind of, you, you, you tell couples that because I think the, I, I think the notion for people in the wedding industry is just, I just want to show my wedding work so that people don't think I'm just doing weddings on the side. And that's kind of the point where they stop where I'm like, yeah, but doing, well, first of all, weddings on the side is a t- terrible way to phrase that, but um, yeah. <laughs> showing couples the benefits like you do, I think is hugely beneficial. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's like show them you and yeah. all the things that you can bring to the table with your unique voice and your unique, uh, you know, the way that you see the world. And you, we only get that as creatives by doing other creative work. Yeah. So I think it's great that you yeah. uh, push that for your yeah, for your team. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I do think couples resonate with that. Um, you know, there is an element uh, that wedding photographers, wedding videographers, there's still a stigma that this is some uh, like low tier um, 
these are the rejects from the from the other industries and they've all now just started shooting weddings because they can't make it anywhere else part of that is um well part of that is maybe slightly true right that's one problem the other the other issue is that the barrier to entry for weddings is so low yeah mm. That the requirement is, do you have a camera and can you get to a wedding? That is <laughs> the, the, that's, that's the requirement to, to yeah. do this job. Um, baseline. Mm. Okay. So like you can't say the same about a big editorial campaign. You can't, you can't just walk into that job. Um, so that's probably some of the things that we're fighting, but mm. um, I do think, I do think couples um, respond well to the fact that we're all doing other things and there's interest there. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to an extent, but I think as you guys know, weddings are a certain muscle, uh, Mm -hmm. with, with video work or photo work. I sometimes hear couples, Oh, like, you know, we're going in another direction. My friend is a, uh, is a fashion photographer and he's going to shoot the wedding. Well, if that they could be the best photographer in the world, if they've not done weddings, that is probably not going to go great. Yeah, <laughs> or it's not going to go as good as they think it will. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I even see like some of the very high end photographers who do like the royal wedding and some of this other stuff, and I look at it and I go, I could name a dozen people right now who would do a better job than that, mm-hmm. who are just in the wedding industry, just normal wedding shooters who would. Um, without even trying to do a much better job than the best, the best, most famous photographers in the world. It is just a very specific muscle to do weddings. Um, and so sometimes we have to educate our clients on that, but most of the time I think people get it. I think, um, they see the depth of the portfolios and they know the experience and that I think that that does usually win the day. Yeah. What do you, when you go to weddings and when you're at your work and you're doing what you do, do you feel like you have a deeper feeling for the work that you do? Like, like what is your deep why for doing this work? You know, it, it's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, when we first started out and when we were kind of what I was saying, like finding our, our voice and our style, um, it was a lot more selfish and it was a lot more about us pushing ourselves as creatives and, and artists. Um, and there was this sort of a mentality of like this next wedding is like going to get me somewhere. Um, Mm. That, that has definitely changed. I don't, I, I do think there's a, a flaw in that thinking. However, I, 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 we, I don't know if we would be where we are if we didn't have that sort of era in our journey. Mm. To an extent, there, is, there does have to be a selfishness to this because for a couple of reasons. One, I, I don't think you will really push yourself as an artist unless you have that. But two, I think you'll get worn out a lot quicker in this industry if you're not doing something that you love and you're pursuing and passionate about and trying to constantly one-up yourself. Mm. I think you will get really bogged down and just doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Um, and so I, 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 don't know, I don't know where that, that balance is. I think everyone has to find that for themselves. But I do think um, being a little bit selfish um, – is actually an okay thing. There's, there's mm-hmm. limits to that. Of course. Um, I yeah. see a lot of people in, in the New York industry because we do photo and video. It's really interesting. We, we sometimes do video only and work with a random photographer or mm-hmm. a lot of times shooting photo only work with a random videographer. And, um, there is just, I'm just always astounded at the egos you see, um, <laughs> on, on people. And it's just, it's so foreign to me now where I'm at in, mm-hmm. in our career. Um, I just, I, I it is, I'm so checked out of like trying to make myself look good or anything like that. Um, and, um, 
now I would say the shift is focused more to stability and making our clients happy. That's really mm-hmm. that like, I just want to kill it for our couples and I don't, I don't need to one up myself anymore to an extent. I feel like we found our kind of style and of course there's always fun little things to try and unique things, but gener- generically speaking about our work, we've sort of found our voice and that's what people want to hire us for. And so I don't want to deviate too far from that. So mm-hmm. now I just get a lot of joy in just showing up and just really helping that couple have an awesome wedding day. And, um, it's amazing that it took like over 10 years maybe to get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think I always think about like how epic this is that they get to have this work forever and it gets mm-hmm. passed on generations. Part of this perspective I have now came off of me doing a lot of commercial directing work where I was, um, this is when I was signed as a director and I was doing a lot of treatments and traveling for random jobs. And um, it was exciting at first and I did enjoy it. And there's, getting on set with a big crew of people and having that collaboration is really, really fun. I really miss that. However, it started to really wear me down that I would work on this commercial and I would finish it and you would maybe barely get a thank you from that client. And at the end of the day, most people watching it want to click skip and no one cares about it. You're just trying to make some big, rich company bigger and richer. And that started to really bug me. Um, mm. And I started to have a new perspective on weddings and started to care a lot more about them. And just thinking about like, wait a second, this is almost the exact opposite. Yeah, it's not going to be seen by a million people, but to like a few people, it will be watched and cherished for so long. And... um that's that's pretty cool. Like I and I, I think about like my grandparents or great grandparents. Like how how much would you pay to see 4K footage of them for an entire? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Like the thought that that could happen for someone in 50 to 100 years from now that they're going to look back on someone that they barely knew or never even met. Maybe it was their their great grandparents, great great grandparents. Um that we get to kind of provide that for them is, is pretty awesome. I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm at now. That's kind of my headspace in, in all this. And obviously we have kids and we have a family now. And I think about our other shooters and so stability, making sure everyone's taken care of mm-hmm. making sure we're all enjoying life. Those are things that kind of matter to us more um, than you know, what is this wedding going to do for me? And and how can I push myself to the next level? We're kind of past that phase, even though that is an important phase. I think we're just sort of on that next uh, uh, stage of our career. Yeah. Yeah. The the question is, Ryan, are you making sure that you have that kind of content for your family as well? Because every time I think of creative individuals or anything like that, I always think of that old saying, the cobbler's children have no shoes. (laughs) All the time it's going through my head and, and quite often, you know, I'll be doing something at a family event and I'll be like, Oh my goodness, I can't, I I don't want to deal with the camera today. I just want to be here. But the other voice in my head is like, no, you have to, at least grab a few images of people here because they're not always going to be here. So are yep. you making sure that you have that kind of content for your family? We, we certainly try. Obviously these make it much easier to do that now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, maybe it sounds similar to you. We, um, I'm not a carry a camera around all the time type of photographer. I know some, no. some of my friends who shoot weddings do that. I'm a little bit and em- envious of that because I think, um, well, for one, they get these beautiful, fun photos of their family and it's really a a cool way to, um, I guess a cool way to get back into the hobby of photography, which I, which there's, there's a, there's a joy in that, that kind of tapping back to when we all first had our cameras, when it was exciting and new. And I think that's, that's something that we all, 
probably either consciously or subconsciously want to get back to a little bit, right? Like that, yeah. that is, that was such a cool moment in all of our careers where we were just, all these things were so new, like how to make a, a, a beautiful image. And, um, so like, I am envious of that, but, um, yeah, occasionally we'll do like, uh, some, some fun, like film shots or, or something like that. But for the most part, the phone takes over and we don't like carrying cameras around. Um, yeah. And, uh, but you know, now with kids, you're just constantly, there's just always something and you're taking out your phone and, yeah. Yeah. and capturing it. But, um, yeah. And are you, are you printing them off? Cause I'm, I'm looking at your background here and I'm not seeing any like, photographs <laughs> on your back wall or anything like that. So I just want to, we miss- just moved. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we just moved. We just moved. So it's, it's very, fine. we're actually, we're actually in the future third kid's room our office so ah, it's all very like temporary wow. and we have a, a garage outside that's detached a, a very large garage that we're gonna actually rebuild into a shoot full shooting studio office um oh. kind of hangout zone so that's sort of our long-term uh plan with that and um, oh. maybe maybe in a few years if we, if we have another conversation you'll be able to see that in the background <laughs> but um yeah, for now it's 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 a little it's a little empty. It looks very it, it looks very uh, stale back here for sure. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. It's fine. The, you were talking there about like wanting to do your best for the couple, and that's what sort of is pushing you along these days. And earlier, yeah. you were sort of talking about wanting to work with clients that you're happy working with. But on the flip yeah. side, there like there's the client experience as well. Like you want them to be happy working with yeah. you. So yeah. what, what do you do within this sort of pre-production stage within your client experience to sort of get them excited to be working with you? Yeah. I mean, well, one thing is just making it as easy as possible to work with you. So answering emails quickly, um, we usually have no more than a 24 hour turnaround on anything, any phone call, email, text, anything like that. Um, part of that is having Kate, our studio manager help with that, but it's also just a priority that we've made. Um, our editing, you know, during the day I'll spend more time answering emails, not actually more time, but I will make more of a priority to answer emails and talk with clients and make sure they're taken care of. Um, and this is, it's amazing. Like we have won so many jobs just because we communicate quicker we will have like 10 emails back and forth before the next guy even sends the pricing. Um, We've we've gotten a lot of work that way. Clients tell us like, yeah, like honestly, like it was huge that you just communicated right away. You just made the pain of wedding planning go away. Um, So part of it is just all that stuff in the beginning, just making it really easy for them. Um, You know, we have a bit of like, we don't have like a defined pre-wedding routine. We always tell our couples, we kind of let them lead that. And what I mean is, especially in New York, there's so many different types of clients and couples. Sometimes a planner is involved for it from the beginning. Sometimes it's a month of coordinator. Sometimes it's a venue coordinator. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's a couple that wants to be really involved or really not involved. So I don't, it's never felt right for us based on our clients to kind of force feed. You need to go through these steps with us in order for this to work. Yeah. There is a survival guide that we send our couples three months out that has just some quick tips and tricks to think about. And then like four requirements, four things that we just need from them before the wedding. These are just like very stand, you know, we need a timeline. We need point of contact. We need Mm. to know if there's an insurance requirement that just kind of the base, a family photo list. Um, but they kind of do that on their own time. And, um, yeah, we find that like some couples book us and we see them a year later at the wedding with almost no communication because that's what they want. Um, and other couples are, we're just like constantly talking with them and, and, um, I was, you know, we just, we, we follow their lead on that and I'm happy to kind of go in whatever direction they want to go. Um, Mm. you know, day of the wedding, like this is a little harder for me because I 
my personality tends to be very like quiet, introverted, a bit maybe stoic looking at times where I'm just kind of like in a thinking mode. Uh-huh. Um, but this is something that I find, this is the easiest tip to for anyone to adopt, but this is something I find that most people fail at is just having a smile on your face all day long. Like, it, it, it sounds so silly, but I, I can't tell you how helpful it is to the couple to look over to you. And for you, they want to know, one, you're enjoying it because yeah. this is their wedding day. This is the biggest day of their life. They kind of have an expectation that everyone's going to love that day. Um, and so you need to be in on that and you need to be enjoying it too. And so even if you're having a stressful week or whatever's going on in your life, you got you to gotta show up and smile. Yep. You got to be there. Um, for me, like I'm, uh, I'm constantly checking in with them to make sure they're taken care of. Can I get you a water? Do you need anything? Yeah. Like, how are you feeling about this? Like, I'm, con- I'm as the photographer or videographer, you're glued to them all day. You become their chaperone, and you become their kind of. Uh, the therapist and protector yeah. and yeah. there's sort of like all these roles that we fill um, maybe slightly more with photo than video, I will say. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still an element of you. I, I very tuned in to their emotions and how they're feeling and like always paying attention to their facial expressions. And make, you can, you, you can sense when something's off, when something's wrong, if they need something, you, you go up and help the situation yeah. Like it, it could be anything. Sometimes it's like putting your camera down and just fixing something that, that went wrong. Um, and so um, couples really appreciate that. That's something we didn't do as much of earlier on in our career. Yeah. Um, it's something that comes very natural to Heidi, much more for her than me. Um, Heidi is, uh, wish you could meet her, but she's the type that um, uh, you, you, Basically, all of our brides believe that they are best friends with Heidi at the end of every wedding. Um, <laughs> I love that. It's, awesome. it's it's actually it's actually it's it's so good that it's bad, and the fact that like we have <laughs> we have to you, you know we shoot so many weddings, you you kind of have to break up with these people at some point, right? And so <laughs> yeah. you can't you can't physically be best friends with that many people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. Uh, you know, she has a much easier time connecting with, uh, with couples than I do even. But, um, Mm. I think that, that actually, you know, reading through like reviews on our, on our Google page and stuff like that, I find that to be a very common thread, not just for Heidi and I, but for our other shooters, it's just people like us on just a human level. Mm. And that is massive. And, and especially with video, it's easy to get caught up in the technicality of, of our job and, yep. and, um, and oftentimes couples do not care about that. Mm. Yeah. I, I think that was a, a hard lesson for me to realize like midway through our career was the fact that I have just got to um, reduce everything and stop thinking like a filmmaker all the time and just approach the day as a person and not yeah. a video guy. And just actually just be myself at a wedding and, yeah. and be helpful. And e- even, even the last wedding, uh, this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous. I don't even know why I'm admitting this, but, um, they were struggling putting on their buttonholes. And I realized yeah. whatever the mechanism was that they had on, I actually didn't know how to do it and I couldn't help. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go away and learn how to do a buttonhole <laughs> with this specific clasp because I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. I mean, how embarrassing is that? <laughs> but I do like to try and be as helpful as I can. Yeah. Um, we, had a, we had a couple of strange interactions recently where the bride at the last wedding we were working on walked by and went, she said something and then she was like, good, if you guys are happy, then I'm happy. And we, and we were both <laughs> mm-hmm. like, it's your wedding day. You, you should be happy anyway, surely. <laughs> but you want us, the suppliers, to be happy? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And then like another yeah. booking that we got recently on the bottom of their booking form, they said, we just want you guys and the photographer to have a good day as well. This was for an elopement. Yeah. So they were like, yeah. as long as you guys have a good day, that's what we want. And just do anything creatively you want to and we'll be happy. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I love, I love, we we hear that a lot as well. It's funny. Um, I think there's an element of that they respect your work, and so they want you to be comfortable making that work. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that when you hear that, I think that's a really good sign because I think it means that your work is at the level of oh they they think this is like magic that we're performing essentially <laughs> yeah they have no idea how it's done but they want to make sure the magician is comfortable um and um yeah it's but uh, and also i think it just speaks to the personality of the couples like those weddings usually are going to be really fun yeah. yeah and they are concerned with um creating an environment that everyone can have fun around them and so like that's their their head is like is not like inward focus. It's like, let's all have a good time. And obviously that just like goes well for, for what we're trying to do too. So, yeah. yeah. Have you ever, have you ever been shooting a speech and maybe the bride's gone up and she actually thanks you for being there and for doing your job? I, I can't help but get a little bit emotional when that happens. Strangely enough yeah. during speeches, but I'm, I'm editing a film right now where it was another photographer uh, who was getting married and she chose us to be there along with another photographer. And it was so important that we were there and we, there was a, a long bit in the speech where she just opened up about how important it was for us to be there. Yeah. And I've just finished editing that speech. But during that moment, I remember on the day getting emotional and even on my, on my computer, I was getting emotional there as as well, but while, yeah. while editing away and I just thought, man, it's so special that we get to have that kind of relationships, that kind of relationship with our clients. Yeah. Yeah. It is something special. Um, but I mean, for me now having two daughters, um, and a third on the way, um, <laughs> is, um, the, all the daddy daughter moments, um, hit me pretty hard <laughs> on yeah. wedding days. Um, I don't know how common this is in, in the UK, but occasionally we do first looks dad and daughters before yeah. the groom. Yeah. Um, so if those happen and the dad starts crying, I'm done. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like teary eyed trying to make sure I get focused. Mm. And, um, so those moments or, uh, you know, obviously like the first dance or the walking down the aisle, all those, those sort of traditional father bride, uh, moments. Um, those, those tend to get me pretty hard now. I sometimes yeah. warn, warn our couples, um, or they'll like look over and like wonder why I'm like uh, completely glossed over. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I like those as uh, as well. Those those moments with the the dad seeing his daughter for the first time. We uh, uh, I don't know if this is a common thing, but we call them dad traps, um, just because dads over here don't tend to show emotions very mm. often, or or that tends to be stereotypically, yeah, stereotypically, you know, terrible. Um, but they tend to open up and, and well up during those moments where they, they open the door and the bride's got her dress on and we've sneakily put a, a little microphone in his little jacket pocket just to capture what he says. Yeah. Oh, I love those moments. They get, they get me every yeah. time. They, they get me every time. Um, so it's, it's interesting because it, yeah, it's taken all, I mean, yes, I always appreciated those starting out, but it's taken so many years for me to get to that point where that is what I live for now. And yeah. that those moments are really why I'm there. Um, mm. I mean, how long, how long have you two been doing this? We've been 13 years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So very, very so pr yeah. pretty much right around the same time. Yeah. Mm. So that, that sort of arc, uh, is probably, I don't know if you could relate to anything I was saying there, but, um, mm -hmm. seems like we're, kind of landing in a similar zone yeah. Uh, yeah. where we are, where you, where you two are. Hey, I'm Ashley from With Jack. 
I'm one of the sponsors of the Perspective podcast. With Jack helps to keep photographers in business by supporting them financially and legally if they have problems with a client or they make a mistake in their work. We've all had that fear of our CF card or our hard drive failing and losing important photos. You can find out more at withjack.co.uk. Head over there and find out how we can help you be a confident creative. Your style of work. Um, in fact, yeah, tell us about the style of films that you create. Not your team, just you. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Like whenever, of course, I'm sure you get this a lot too. Clients will ask this as well. <laughs> yeah uh, how how do you how do you do how do you describe your style? Mm. I've always had a very hard time answering this. Um, and for clients, I always just say, well, more than anything I can say in words, the, just watch the work. That's, that's what matters more than anything I can tell you. Um, but because I'm talking to filmmakers, I can't just say that. Um, so, um, you know, I would say big picture our, our, the whole way we see things is rooted in our architectural background. Okay. In architecture, there, there's, um, you spend a lot of time thinking about a sense of place. You, you spend a lot of time thinking about uh, a story in your work in terms of circulation and how people move through spaces. Um, there tends to be, uh, in architecture, you, you're thinking about huge, big site plans, aerial views, all the way down to little door details, right? So mm. that kind of mentality, I think, somehow infiltrated into our filmmaking work. Okay, interesting. And it, just just as a side, just as a side note to that, it's been really weird because we get a lot of architect clients. Okay, and yeah. I, I talk with these architects, and I, when they find out that was our background the, the, we all kind of have this okay that makes sense why there, there's some, there's something there that seems to be architectural in nature might be more in our photo work than our video work mm -hmm. but um i think there is something there with with the video work um you know there's some sort of mix of uh of sort of real documentary um uh, very unstaged moments mixed with a fast beat cinematic kind of storytelling. Mm -hmm. But there is, um, there is enough variation in the work that I would say there's a slight, and we can get into this a little bit too, but there's a slightly uh, client led style. Um, we approach our clients after every wedding and talk to them about what they would like to see. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we, we ask them, uh, you know, uh, do you want speeches? Uh, do you want vows? Or do you want this to be more like a music video? We talk about song selection. Um, you know, because we are not having things scored to our edit, mm. um, which is a traditional, if you go in commercial TV movies, you work with some type of scratch track or temp track to create an edit, but then someone scores to your edit, um, which is, for a lot of reasons, a good way to do it. <clears throat> um, but of course, when you're doing weddings, you don't have um, the ability to, most people do not have things scored to their edits. So we're oftentimes letting the, the music track dictate um, the flow of, of whatever we're trying to, whatever we're trying to do. So mm. one, we spent a ton of time tracking down music um, <laughs> yeah. and then, and then we use that to our advantage to tell us to, to tell whatever story we want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to see, to hear what you guys would say about the work. Um, I, you know, like, again, it's just like, I feel like you you get so zoned in on your own thing. You don't really even know what you're doing. Mm. I mean, you are right. Yeah, I, I I do get the impression that you are more client led, um, by the way that you shoot as well. Hmm. But 
I do wonder, like, is when when you when you have these varying stories to tell from from couples and and the way that they want you to present a film. Do you ever think about um, shooting techniques? Like, d- does the process ever come down to like on the day I, I'm going to do things differently today because of yeah. this couple in particular? You know, like they they want more of a handheld kind kind of vibe, like a more of a homemade type vibe. D- does that kind of process come through on the on the day, or like are there any go to techniques that you kind of rely on, and then? make that kind of feeling in the edit? That's a great question. I mean, um, for the most part, we approach each wedding day the same. And what I mean by that is there's still a lot of um, playing off of the couple's personality. Yeah. And I think if you have calls ahead of time, emails, even showing up on the day, if you're observant to it, you, you, you get a good sense of kind of what interests they have, Mm -hmm. what may be important to them on a wedding day. Um, you can, again, you can kind of infer this also from what kind of videos they may be mentioned in the initial questionnaire. Oh, we loved this wedding that you did. Okay. So Mm -hmm. that tells me they are interested in a party and they want this video to look like a party and they want people watching it to feel like they missed out on a party. Right. Like, yeah, that's the vibe. Yeah. Now I wouldn't say it changes a whole lot how we shoot. Um, and like some of our portfolio is quite old. Some of it's kind of new. It's a mix of, there's a a long era that's being shown in our current portfolio, but nowadays, um, we shoot handheld Mm. all day except for ceremony and speeches. So we're, we're never, um, on a tripod or a monopod and I shoot the entire day on one, one fixed lens. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a setup that is, you know, just very, very small. Um, I find that it allows us to feel like we're just a guest with a camera, which is definitely yes. a goal of ours on any wedding. Yeah. Um, and I also feel like, um, and this has changed over the years, but with video, um, it's very easy to get bogged down in a lot of technical things and um, gear mm. and um, all these different tools that we have at our disposal. We kind of went through that phase a little bit. We never dove too heavily into that. But yeah. now where I'm at is, mm. again, being a good human being on the day of yep. and just being ready to capture anything. And I find that a very simple setup. Mm -hmm. is the best way to do that. Um, You know, I've been on weddings where we're doing photo and there's a videographer and they are literally just like missing tons of amazing (laughs) moments because they're balancing their gimbal. Yeah. Or they're fidgeting with something. And Mm -hmm. um, to me, I just think that misses the mark in such a big way. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And uh, so, you know, part of our style is certainly uh, feels probably very raw because of that handheld Mm. um, nature to it. There's like we're manual focusing all day. Things are falling in out of focus. Something's wobbly. It's not the perfect shot, Mm. but we sort of use that to our advantage. And I think create an energy with that. Um, Mm. And um, there's, again, there's just a freedom to handheld shooting. Yeah. that uh, other types of shooting, I think, lacks uh, in a big way. But, um, yeah, happy to like talk, talk more about any one of those things. But Yeah. yeah. Well, we, I, we, we take a similar approach. Um, and, again, this was something that we f- kind of learned like halfway into our career. Maybe not even halfway, actually. It's, we've been shooting like that for a while. But um, I do remember... Like we used to go to weddings and it, it used to be like all, almost formulaic, right? It was, mm. I want to get this show. I want to have a, cause we used sliders back in the old days. I don't know if you remember, do you remember sliders? God, those horrible, we had them. horrible <laughs> things. We uh, had them. Yep. 
yeah, the the I think did we talk about this in the last episode? I can't remember, but the whole like aisle reveal from behind the last row yeah. to reveal, and you're like you're going through a checklist of things, and then you're like, oh, it's this you're becoming a machine, and it you don't at that point you're not really creating like you. To me now, like a wedding film is full of emotion and tears and hugging and it, it's not the the perfect reveal from behind an uh you know, a seat to the couple standing in the middle of an aisle. You know, it's yep. it is handheld and um it's handheld because you are the fastest you can be when you are handheld. Yeah. Like if there's a yeah. moment over here and a moment over here, you're just here and then you can run over here and shoot. And it's very much a, uh, you are just a person. You don't need to think about, Oh, got to get all the legs of my tripod, lift up my camera, move over here, set it yeah. all up. And by that point, the moment's gone Yeah, and it's, yeah. So right. for us, it's very emotion driven. I totally agree with what you were saying about, your style, the way you approach a wedding, it doesn't tend to change too much based on what you know beforehand. Yeah. Because yeah. Like, we've got a questionnaire that we send out to our couples that we've had the same questionnaire for quite a few years now. <laughs> and we've said to ourselves, like, we told ourselves back then that, oh, this is because we'll learn more and we'll know what's mm. important to them and we'll, it'll decide how we approach a day. But really, it, it doesn't change much. And mm, yeah. we read it and it's like, oh, that's cool to know. Yeah. But then... We still shoot handheld 90% of the day, only sermon speeches on tripods. Mm. But so, yeah, it doesn't change yeah. that much, really. Yeah. The yeah. thing it does I change. I think it's self evident. Yeah. But the, the thing uh, going back to kind of what you were talking about is what it does help with is that client relationship, which you can go in and you kind of, you already know who the bride is, you already know kind of her interests and stuff and and maybe you found out you've got similar interests like mm -hmm. i love uh, i love gaming and i love when i go to a bride's house and she's a gamer too and we're just like nerding out about zelda or something mm -hmm. crazy or 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 talking whiskey or or you know, like all these other things and you kind of have like you create that little bit of a an excited weird bond in the in yeah. the kind yeah. of kind of this part of the day and it lasts throughout the whole day and that kind of excitement is fun when you have it with yeah. a client and yeah, yeah then you'd really do start to have a good time at a wedding <laughs> it can and it can really open up um what that couple gives you in like a portrait session for instance yes um this is this is a much harder job for a videographer than a photographer Mm. because there still is more of a focus on the photographer running things on a wedding day. And so when I show up and I'm just doing video, um, now I have the relationship of the photographer and the bride and groom to manage, not mm. just the bride and groom. Whereas with when I'm doing photo only, I be, especially because I shoot video, Mm -hmm. I know, I know I'm going to get the videographer good shots that, so I don't have to worry about them having to do fancy things or, or I don't really have to worry about necessarily even how good they are at their job because I'm going to give them something great to work with, yeah. um, which you don't always get the other way. Yeah. Um, you know, and so sometimes it's very hard like with video because it's a, a last minute add on or it was, you know, they're just not, they don't think about it as much. Um, so it can be, it can be tricky to connect mm -hmm. sometimes, but um, going back to what you're saying. Yeah. I think just with like the, what's important to the couple, I think that becomes self evident the day of, if you're observant to it Yeah. yeah. versus looking down at a list of, Oh, what did they say about what they, Oh, whoops. I just missed that moment. Um, <laughs> you know, so, um, I think, and, and again, being handheld lets you follow the action wherever it is very quickly. Yeah. So, um, I'm always ready to capture something. And, uh, again, if there's a relationship, say it's a grandmother, the last living grandma is there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that, if that's important to them, they're not going to ignore the grandma all day. 
So I don't have to manufacture this moment. Yeah. They're, of yeah. course, going to spend time with this person and have a moment with them. So if you're ready for it, you'll get it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, setting up a slider in the reception, trying to get that detail shot down the table, that's not going to get it. You know, yeah. that's not going to get you there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, yeah. let, um, let, but, yeah. Let's let's get bogged down in gear for a minute then. So what what is the specifics of your kit? You said it's usually one lens all day. So what, what camera body and lens yeah. are, are you using? Yeah. Well, we are Fuji ambassadors. So we shoot all Fuji gear. Um, not because, because we're ambassadors. We, we fell in love with the gear, a couple of things about it. The GFX we fell in love with for photo reasons the medium format camera is just mm. an amazing amazing image quality not super well suited to weddings but we enjoy that about it uh, it's not for everyone for video we use um well now we use uh the xh2s um uh, before that we were on xt4s before that xt3s xt2s uh we shot a little bit on the xh1s as well um but the xh2s in my opinion, is like the best wedding camera um, for a couple reasons. One, I think uh, crop frame is very well suited to weddings for the fact that you get you kind of get that middle ground of good image quality, larger sensor than say a micro four thirds, but mm -hmm. also you get pretty good stabilization, better than full frame. So yeah. because we're handheld all day, that's kind of important to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure full frame cameras will get better stabilization over time, but I think it will just always be true that the smaller sensor gets the better stabilization. So that for us has felt really like a really nice sweet spot. Mm. Um, people often forget that the Arri Alexa is a crop frame sensor. The, the cameras that most movies yeah. are shot on is not full frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most people, uh, a wedding filmmaker, I, this got lost on me very early on in our career where you just think bigger, better. And there's <laughs> a, there is a small truth to that, but, um, I think there's, I think it's, it's not everything. Right. And there's mm -hmm. so much more to how a film will look other than the sensor size. Um, but, um, now the cameras are, I mean, it's like amazing compared to where we started, right? Like 4k <laughs> 120. And like you can, like there's even like a a, a, a full gate 6K mode on the XH2S, which is yeah. great for certain situations. So um, there is, uh, yeah, it's just it's just a great time to be in, in doing what we're doing because the tools are amazing now. Yeah. Um, the uh, lens of choice now is this Laowa 33 uh, f.95. It's um, yeah, it's this big. It's got a, 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 a declicked aperture. Um, the throw on the focus is, is really buttery and it's like, um, it's like a $400 lens, $500 lens. No, I think it's like 400 bucks. If I drop it on a wedding day, I'll just, it's okay. I'll just buy another <laughs> one. Not, I'm not going to cry about it. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, this has been really fun to shoot on and get some really fun, like flares on the dance floor and stuff like that. Mm. But, um, that's pretty much it. We have some other primes we use in, in extreme situations where I need like that, you know, a, a longer lens or a wider lens, but um, that's really ceremony and speeches. We'll put a long lens on and, yep. and kind of stand back a little bit, but mm. um, yeah, pretty much the entire day is shot on that one setup. It's like a 50 millimeter equivalent. Um, and so, yeah, the XH2S gives you a free punch in. So you get another like, 20 you know you can get from like 50 to like 70 millimeters mm -hmm. um all with the ability to shoot in 4k so mm -hmm. um you kind of get you kind of get two lenses out of it i guess you could say but yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah that's I, that's sort of um that's sort of my my primary setup yeah that's cool you know that that thing about um how good cameras are today i was having this conversation online with someone and they were talking about um i funnily enough it was log the log conversation again that we keep having on this podcast so like yeah log and 10 bit and 
and they were like, "Oh, do you ever struggle?" And I'm like, "No. If I if I ever feel like I'm I'm struggling with with what I have right now, I remember like." 12 years ago when we were shooting on a, uh, what was it? Was it a Sony? 60D maybe? Uh, 60D. Was before mm. that. Do you remember our first cameras, the EX3s? Oh God. This was like a oh, camcorder wow. on rails, but I really wanted that kind of cinema kind of depth of field. So we had a Lettuce 35 um, converter. Now this thing was mm-hmm. essentially, you, you'd, you know, macro focus onto the back of the lens and it would, um, the, the plane would vibrate. So you'd have to have a battery in it and it would allow for that kind of like that 35 millimeter depth of field. Right. And then you'd put wow. lens on that. So this thing was like massive and, yeah. and super heavy. And, yep. <laughs> and I'm like, and I can't even remember what codecs it shot, but pro- probably not healthy ones uh, for color grading and all that. So uh, <laughs> when people come to me and like, Oh, it's, you know, you're, you're not shooting in the right bit. Deb. I'm like, come on. Yeah. Just, you, <laughs> Again, I, I feel like I'm sounding old again, but like you, you kids just don't know how good you've got it. You really don't. <laughs> well, no, but there is truth. I mean, we are we are approaching. I would I would argue we are we are plateauing in terms of the year over year quality mm-hmm. increase. Like so, the last yeah. ten years we've we've gone from the first. Uh, SLR DSLR video camera to now um, shooting. I've done shoot commercial shoots where my Fuji camera is being cut in with Alexa footage. Yeah, yeah. And it work and it look and it looks good. It's hard to yeah. tell. Um, so we're approaching kind of an end game here where it's not is really um, not going to be huge. I'm sure low light will continue to improve, but um, for the most part, we're, we're very lucky now. And, uh, yeah, especially for us, we, we loved shooting in 120 for like portraits yeah, and, um, and some dance floor stuff at times. And so I, I, I will say the one kind of very technical leap we've had is the 4k 120 since mm-hmm. a few years back. And, and that, that I've enjoyed having just, just being able to have that the full video in 4k is nice, but it's never been a deal breaker. I mean, we initially shot on five D's. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, handheld, no stabilization, <sighs> just it, like so many things working against you. <laughs> like <laughs> so many, like you have like no help with anything trying to get yeah. that shot. Um, and we made it work, and it was fine. You, you, but um, but now it's great. It's like fully stabilized and peaking yeah. and focus checking and mm-hmm. zebras and all the stuff you have right built into the camera now. Um, yeah. do, what what do, do you guys shoot on? So we're Sony um, A seven S three A seven S three. Apart from yeah. the A seven four, yeah, um, which again yeah. is quite handy to do the whole punch in thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, but you, when you were shooting with the five D, was it the five D Mark Twos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first camera I ever owned. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean it was a. I mean, was it the changed first one I bought. changed the industry. Yeah. It changed so much. Do you remember yep. it, it had um, a third party software that you could install to get like yeah. graphs and uh, to get rid of the limit, the recording yeah. limit? Yeah. Oh man. Magic Lantern. Mm-hmm. Magic Lantern, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, yeah. That, oh yeah. Man. That was I me- that I messed was... around with that. Yeah, yeah, that was and there was <laughs> I remember like later iterations of Magic Lan- Lantern let you do raw. Oh recording. yeah. Yeah, I remember that. And remember that. um like I mean it was really raw. Like you, like a whole wedding day would it be would be like two terabytes of footage, you know, mm. uh, more, more probably actually, it was just, it was crazy. But some, some people were like really into it. Like, Oh, raw, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> there were some diehards um, for sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, do you, do you have any like tips or, 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 or techniques that you use to help you shoot handheld for our listeners who might be thinking, I want to try it, but I'm scared that our footage is going to be just, shaky um yeah. especially for photographers i think because um they might be wanting to dabble in video yeah yeah uh, in fact, a, a lot of photographers have come to me and, and asked for tips and stuff um but yeah do, do you have any for them 
you know, I mean, the, the easiest thing you can do is go out and test some of this stuff. Know where your limitations are. I've, over the years, have developed extremely steady hands that I can handhold very long lenses. Mm-hmm. That's just how I am. I don't know. Uh, ben uh, on our team, his footage tends to be pretty shaky. He doesn't have steady hands. Um, he's kind of worked that into his style, which okay. is interesting. Uh-huh. Um, and again, there is a rawness, a realness to that, that, uh, I don't know if it's like a home camera vibe or there's just, mm. you can tell there's a human element to that operation, yeah. but, um, he's, he's just, it's, it's embedded in his style now. But, uh, yeah, I would say like in terms of like handheld, just really knowing your limitations, knowing, okay, with this like stabilization and, and, uh, and this lens and doing like a backwards walking, this is kind of how that's going to look and kind of knowing what to expect. Maybe even like taking it into, um, into your editing software and putting more stabilization on say, Oh, does this work or not? You know, just, just testing things out like that, I think is really good. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, the, the other thing is like, it doesn't always have to be moving, our our work, much of our work, almost every shot is moving. Um, or many shots are, um, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't have to be that. It can you know locked you know go watch uh, go watch you know um, you know No Country and Roger Deakins and mm. see some of those locked off shots and tell me that that is not just a complete masterclass in locked off shot yeah. storytelling right yeah um you, you know you don't need fancy things to do it so it was, i think part of it's just like developing your own style your own voice and, and that just takes time and repetition and, and things mm-hmm. like that um but for photographers i would just say you already know how to get exposure right so that that part of the equation is and you already should know basics on lighting and composition so all those things are good so um you know, what I would say is trying to get in and edit some of your work. Mm. Um, even if, even if ultimately you hire an editor to do your stuff, I do think there is a back and forth editor to shooter or I guess editor to directors. There's kind of the role we're playing on a wedding day is like being able to see how, okay, I directed this shot, this shot, this shot. I'm in the editing room. How does that come together? What did I miss? What did I miss? Mm. You know, that kind of stuff. So I do think actually editing the work, even if it's not great, if it's just like exploratory, I think is important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that when you go to a wedding as a photographer, you're confident that you're going to get the filmmaker, some amazing shots like on couple shoot. So what, what yeah. is your approach to the couple shoot and like, do you have any go-to like setups or instructions for the couple that you know are going to get you that stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, one reason I know that is because we've had this hybrid approach for so long that when we, when say Heidi and I, or me and anyone else on our team are shooting together, we're not, it's not like here's the photo time and here's the video time, which if, Photo, the photographer and the videographer are, are very different. You might have to do that. That That is a scenario that might have to just be the case if it's so different that there's just no way you can overlap each other. Mm. And we've been there before. Um, but for us, just because I know I'm constantly moving our couples, um, that I would say like 80% of our photo work is the couple in motion. Yeah, And yeah. there's nothing worse as a videographer when you get there and the photographer is having them go into all these really static, stiff poses all day. Mm. It's really frustrating because it doesn't really look good on video. It looks very fake and staged and it looks, um, you know, like you're just taking video of a photo, like it's yeah. not real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, of course, there are some, there is some of that and I think some of that mixed in can be cool, but... Um, for the most part, I'm telling our couples to move in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, it depends on the couple. Again, each session is a little different with the portraits in terms of like playing off their personalities. Mm -hmm. Some couples I know, like 
if I ask them to dance, they're going to just like go wild no matter where they are, even if it's super embarrassing. Other couples is just like, I won't even mention that to them just because they're, they're, they're not going to, they're going to feel, they're going to get self-conscious and feel more uncomfortable. And it's going to make more shots look less comfortable. You know, it's going to just compound and, and get worse. Yeah. So, you know, some couples need 10, 15 minutes of warming up and just trying stuff that may not look the best, but just to get them a little loose. And um, I think this is where like just having that human element of just being fun and um, a little self-deprecating and recognizing that this is a weird, awkward thing we're all doing right now. Yeah. Um, it's very unusual and it doesn't, we don't have to pretend like this is normal. Like this is weird. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you have cameras locked onto you and we're like, you're wearing these clothes you never wear. And we're in a random public spot or asking you to like have PDA with each other with like <laughs> cuddling and, Oh, we just like, Oh yeah. Snuggle into her neck and all this stuff. And like, yeah. it's, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre thing. So we, I tend to, I tend to just recognize that a little bit with our couples and, and mm-hmm. we can all have fun with it. And, um, no, but it is, it is tricky. That is, I do think it's like kind of the hardest part of the job in a way is like those portrait sessions. And it's where people, I think you can see uh, the stratification of skill level among photographers and videographers is just looking at portraits um, and seeing how well they're able to handle those, those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you have any like go to trick, like not even go to poses or tricks or, like, do you have do you have an a way, do you have a way of approaching a shoot when, say, the photographer is more uh, posed? Yeah, I mean, if a photographer is too posy, I now I I I do now tell the photographer <laughs> after you get this shot, can I try something? Um, yeah. Just because what I'm getting on camera is just it's just not going to be seen. I'm not going to use it. I know I'm not going to use it. So it's like, why I don't want him to think that's getting to be, you know, him or her to think that that's like good for, for what I'm trying to get. So, Mm. um, if I mean like a basic, just good first thing to do, if you don't know where to start or if you don't know, um, if the couple's just like feeling a little stiff, just get them walking, Mm -hmm. walking to you, walking away from you, holding hands, stretching out while they're walking, just get some movement, just actual physical mm. movement. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, give, giving them little prompts or things to think about, you know, telling mm. them like, mm. Hey, like have, have a little conversation, but like, you know, we're not here to talk about taxes. We're, we're, we're flirting, you know, <laughs> like this is like, let's have fun with this. You're, you're going, there's a little date night for you. Right. Like that kind of thing where we're trying to get them, loosened up and smiling with each, with each other. And, um, mm. again, I think just moving, just walking is a good first step. That's, that's something anyone can do. Yeah. Um, and you know, it doesn't require complex posing or, or movements or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it is tricky. It is tricky. I mean, like a lot of this does also come down to like seeing other good work and trying to imagine like, Oh, how, how would that have, happened yeah um or how how could i get them into that kind of um you know pose Mm -hmm. um but yeah i think just uh, it's also i guess this is maybe another thing is like yeah being being okay with telling the photographer hey i just need to take uh i i need to take two minutes after you're done here and try something before we leave this spot um nine times out of 10, the photographer is like, Oh yeah. Oh wow. Oh wow, I like that. Oh yeah. That's a good one. That's yeah, a good yeah, one. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, um, pretty quickly, I think you can kind of gain the respect of the photographer if it's going well and you're all of a sudden doing things that they wouldn't be able to do. Um, yes. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of, it's very situational, isn't it? It's like, it, it, it depends it is, on the yeah. couple, it depends on the photographer, the environment, mm-hmm. how that day's going. Yeah. It's just so I, many I, variables. Yeah, I think you're right, though. I think you do garner some respect when you, you know, help, not help out, maybe that's the wrong term, but, like, definitely assist in creating a feel or a mood or put your ideas forth, something that they 
can also like like if I ever am directing or I'm telling a couple to do something or or trying to put them in the mood, the the photographer usually benefits as well, and I try and make yeah. sure that is the case. Um, whether it's like putting them in, like so, sometimes there's like, you know we work with photographers who don't like sharp that like you know that those uh, cutting shadows and and the harsh mm. light, whereas I'd be more inclined to just throw a couple into the harsh light and play around with shapes and stuff. And sometimes yeah. the photographers are like, you know, I, I don't, I didn't feel comfortable doing that because it's not really my style, but I really had a good time yeah. doing this and trying something new while you were doing your stuff. And you do like help each other out. You do learn from each other. And I think it's having that mindset rather than being too scared to initiate an idea in case you're going to stand on someone's toes, because I don't think, yeah. I don't think you're going to go into a situation where the other person's going to feel like you're standing on their toes rather than let's just be creative and play and, and do some ideas that we've maybe had and, you know, go yeah. outside our comfort zone. So, yeah. 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 I think also just being willing to abandon a bad idea. <laughs> oh God, on. yes. You know, it's going to yes. happen, especially as you're starting out. Uh-huh. you're just gonna you're just gonna give them a a prompt that in your head looks one way yes and and you know and then turned out totally differently um yeah. so um just being able to move on and say you know you obviously don't want to make them self-conscious but mm-hmm. uh, the, the lighting isn't what i thought it was let's try something else you know yeah yeah some way to get them past that um, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, that didn't work. I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, not gonna, I find, it's not going to inspire confidence with their couple. Yeah. Do you find yourself in that situation quite often? Because I feel like I do because I'm quite, ex- it's a I, mix. I, try, I try to do new stuff and sometimes yeah. it just doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Like quite often I'm very bad at lying couples down, mm. like imposing them on the floor. I need yeah. to work on that. Or, or even yeah. posing, like, not that we do a lot of, like, posing people sitting or whatever, but sometimes yeah. I just want them to be sitting on a wall or something. Yeah. And I need yeah. to work on that because quite often I've been like, yeah, let's go. Let's just move on. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I, I got yep. it. I'm yeah. very fast at working. <laughs> yeah. And they never see that shot. <laughs> yeah. Um, delete, delete, delete. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> Walk walk us through your your t- typical process for for making a wedding. Then once you've caught all the content that you have from a wedding, like what's yeah. your first step into like pulling an edit that's gonna be good? Yeah, we so yeah we do a lot of prep work. I mean for us, um, like I said, there's a questionnaire that the couple gets the day after the wedding. Mm. And so it's fresh in their minds and they can remember. So it's like basic stuff. Like, is there anything you definitely want to see in the video? Anything you definitely don't want to see in the video? We talk about Mm. music, vows, speeches, things like that. Um, So as we're kind of gathering that info and thinking about song selection, we are um, prepping everything. I'm very meticulous about like organizing the footage and I get it um, very carefully organized so that, um, mm. one, it makes sense to anyone who's editing it. Um, and then, two, it makes it a little easier for us to, like, compile some raw footage chapters throughout the day, which we offer in our packages. Um, mm. So they'll get, you know, a getting ready video, a, a portraits video, a cocktail, you know, all those little, uh, all those chapters. It ends up being, like, 10, 10 videos. Those are mm. unedited. Um uh, aside from the ceremony and speeches, which have a little bit of editing just to make them look nice and polished. So that they click on a ceremony video. They could just watch their ceremony straight through. It's very, I feel like in my opinion, a ceremony and speeches is sort of like a baseline kind of delivery. Um, that's what I've, that's how I've felt. I know people have different opinions on this, but I mm-hmm. feel like, it just it's never sat right to me to not deliver ceremony and speeches yeah. um, unless the couple truly does not care about that or maybe I mean we did like might not even want them to be recorded they just want that to live in that one moment and move on and that's fine mm. 
but for the most part, I feel like ceremony speeches is like baseline. That's what your job is there. You got to get that. Like that's, that's, yeah. that's a big one. Um, the rest of the raw footage is like, yeah, debatable whether you deliver that or not. We always have because mm -hmm. we only typically offer a three to five minute highlight video and then anything else is like an add on. So we're only doing that highlight video. And so I feel like that's a very small thing to give them, even though we spend dozens of hours on that at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it feels like a little like they may feel like, oh, that doesn't compared to this other video videographer who charges half as much, he's delivering like an hour long edit, a 20 minute edit, a five minute edit. Um, and so we've always felt like the raw footage is a good selling point to the client. Like, Hey, you're going to get everything. You can go back and watch whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's usually a lot of prep work with the files um, and uh, creating proxies. Now we have editors that help us get things done. We sometimes dive in and edit Usually at, at the very least, I'm doing all the prep work. Um, so setting up that like premiere file to have potentially like speeches cut, uh, uh, parts of the vows cut that I want to see in the videos, teeing yeah. up the, the music track, thinking about what, how I kind of want that to flow. Mm -hmm. And then if we have an editor help us, they'll kind of do the editing work. We'll then take it to do all the finishing. So yeah. uh, s sound and, and color. Mm -hmm. Um and so, um, that's just like a typical workflow for us. Um, and, uh, yeah, happy to dive into anything more, uh, on any of those points. Yeah. I mean, so you mentioned the, the ceremony and the speeches being the kind of backbone. W would that be the case yeah. with the film that you make? Like what people say and the actual ceremony are those like, the main meats of your film and then everything else is kind of like over the top, like B roll type thing or. Um, it's half and half. I would say like half of our couples want audio in half okay. of our couples want it to be montage music video style. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and that's dependent on the client. And so if you, I think if you watch our portfolio, you'll see there is a mix of that. Um, yeah. some where there's not one bit of audio added in and others where it's like audio the whole way almost. Right. Um, yeah. and so just, that's just been our approach is, is that we want the couples to let us know what they want. Um, I will say there, there's an element of like offloading that decision to the clients that is a little, uh, like a bit of a relief knowing that, okay, I definitely know this is what they want. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like a good example of that is the, the, the first video in our portfolio, um, Jeff and Ashley, it's this like epic wedding in France. They actually wanted pretty much the whole day shot in slow-mo and they did not want audio at all. Um, right. and I told them, Hey, That's if good. we shoot in slow-mo, we're not, it's not going to be like a, a ceremony video and stuff like that. That's okay. That's fine. I want, we want this. And so that one became this sort of like upfront creative um uh sort of like uh um funnel that we had to make this video through um yeah. and uh yeah it's that we shot that like six years ago but it it remains to be one of the uh the fan favorites so we, that, we keep so it up and was that jeff and ashley you said yeah jeff and ashley yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the air balloon i remember that one yeah 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 and, cool experience uh, you know, that, that, so this is a great example of like, we shot that on 5Ds, okay? Terrible yeah. camera to, to compared to now. Um, <laughs> but that video has done us wonders in terms of getting new work. And yeah, um, yeah technically there are things wrong with it. Uh, the, the image and things that we didn't have access to, it was all shot in uh, 1080p and all that kind of stuff. Um, but um kind of no one cares no no client cares about that um yeah you know just get, get the shot get the exposure right try to get it in focus just get the shot be there be ready those are those are just so much more important and of course like different ideas you have um to make that video yeah. happen but um yeah yeah I love I love watching this video by the way. It's it's the it's, perfect it's example. A fun one. Yeah. It, it is it is fun, but it's the perfect example of why you shouldn't be scared to go handheld because yeah. it's just 
some bits are crazy and you you've, you've yeah. used, it's like really fast cut and then other bits you just let the moment happen mm-hmm. uh, it's yeah. really good yeah. it's really yeah. good um yeah yeah do your couples choose your music or do you you know you might you we, mentioned that so you, you, yeah typically i say the most common um is that they ask for some options so we narrow down okay. a list of options yeah and they make a selection mm. second to that is they ask us to pick it and surprise them and then the least common is that they're like we want this song like yeah. we have to have this song i personally for us and how we run our business i don't think it's any of our business to tell them they can't have the wedding song that they want in their video. I'm happy to advise them and guide them against that. If I feel like it's a mistake or if I feel like it could be really difficult to edit a certain thing, say it's a very like lyrical heavy song and they want all these uh, voice overlays. It's like, uh, those are going to conflict. You're not going to, the essence of the song is going to be difficult to, Mm -hmm. you know like so i'm happy to advise people on that um Mm -hmm. but ultimately bottom line is they're paying us money to make this video i feel like i it's my duty to give that to them now there's like a couple stipulations with that if they're picking a well-known track you know we'll tell them hey this could get taken down on instagram you can't post this any you can't publish this we don't have rights to it all that kind of stuff um most of our videos stay private to the couple. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, most of the time we don't pursue licensing, but for things that are on our website or things that are on our Instagram, we pursue license, uh, a license to use the track. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Or permission of some kind. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a little bit of a debate about commercial music and stuff. Yeah. Which I find really interesting, obviously, but you're, you're happy to use any music. You ever worried about well, the if it's, legal ramifications or no, because I've talked okay. to enough band. We've licensed enough music at this point. Mm. Um, I actually, I don't know anyone that does it like we do where we, we really do pursue getting permission and, and or a license from um, yeah. any kind of track that we post. Um, most people either use stock music and then it's not yeah. an issue or they just use it anyway. Um, for the most part, bands and managers and labels really do not care if you deliver a wedding video to a couple and it's just for them. Yes, mm. technically this is kind of in that area of commercial, um, but this is a private personal wedding video that they're using this for. So there's a bit of a gray area there. Mm. And I've found that by and large, people don't care. Now, yeah. if you're using that to promote and put on your website, go on Instagram, any kind of marketing effort, that is now you are definitely heavier in the territory of, okay, you're kind of commercially using this track to mm. get you more business. And so that's where we have gone out and gotten tracks. I mean, we've got, we had just like a couple of years ago, got another Deza track license. It was a pain in the ass because there was so many so many people to pay out on both sides of that license that it was like really annoying, but Mm -hmm. we liked it enough that we like pursued that and got it done. Um, I was, I would say most of the time when we ask for permission, they don't even need, they don't even want the license. They're like, yeah, that's fine. We don't care. Um, So so you're just relying on a written sort of, we've got it in black and white and writing that says you can use it as long as it's private type thing. Yeah. Uh, even songs that we promote with, Hey, we want to put, we did this wedding video for a couple. We want to put it on our Instagram. How do you feel about that? No, no worries. Um, it's, it's just one of those things where it it depends on the track. It depends on the band. I say most tracks we're licensing are from smaller bands. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, it does get tricky if you want to get the work like published somewhere. Um, so like, the France video and we in, in immediately had a uh, publication lined up uh, brides magazine was going to post it. And so, and we had found this track that I found uh, took, it spent like eight hours trying to find this track. I mean, it was like just an obscure French band that uh, 
fit perfectly for what we were trying to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we reached out and uh, I convinced brides to front the bill for the license for the publication and for our usage. And nice. it worked out. And uh, now everyone's yeah. happy. Like brides gets to use it. We get to use it. The band's happy. Um, so again, th- but this takes a lot of time. And so that's why yeah. we don't, we keep most like, if you look at our Instagram, we don't show that much work, um, video work. It's just, we, uh, don't have time to pursue a license for all these tracks. So what I would say is mm-hmm. for people who are doing this stock music is an easy answer to, uh, to solve these problems. And we have used stock uh, music before for certain couples who know they want to get it published. And we're just like, Hey, let's just do, let's just find a cool stock track. We, we get the license and everyone's happy. Um, but if you're going to use it and market with it, I would, I would recommend, you know, just to avoid any problems, recommend tr- at least reaching out and getting permission. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And the smaller the band, the easier that is to do. Yeah. So, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although I will say with smaller bands, they don't often know who has the rights to their songs. Yeah. Which is yes. kind of bizarre. <laughs> Actually, yes. so, I found, so, but Yes. I mean, there is... Uh, you can get into the weeds on that of uh, there's yeah. typically two sides to an ownership of a, um, of yeah. a uh, song. Mm. Most of the time when it's a smaller band um, and we get permission, we get a good answer back from them that's saying, Hey, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, we do take it upon ourselves to say, okay, I think we're in the clear. I don't think anyone's going to, going to care too much about this. Uh, mm. A lot of times we'll credit the song. Sometimes we don't um, yeah. depends on, how that relationship is, but, um, (laughs) yeah, you know, don't necessarily just go and use any track you want. You definitely can't get in trouble for it. And, or Mm. at the very least it just gets taken down and it's like all for nothing. Right. You have this like wonderful video, you post it and then you, and then it gets taken down and, um, and, uh, um, you, you, now you have to re-edit it to another song or something. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a painful process. Having to it's go a back and process. Ah, like, oh, man. Yeah. Um, cool. I know we're we're ticking on here. So yeah, yeah. for people it's who it's, are, it's been enjoyable. I, I should have I, I should have okay, started good. drinking earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Dora, these are non-alcoholic beers. Although that sure being said, are. I do have the I do have the whiskey. <laughs> I do have the whiskey here, which uh, was a gift from Greg for our 100th episode. Yeah, very um, nice, very nice. What advice do you have for aspiring wedding filmmakers who are just starting out, but maybe struggling yeah. with finding their own identity, or struggling in business, or yeah? I mean, it's it's tough, but like. Mm going out and just doing the work is the biggest thing you can do. Just the repetition of going through the whole process with video. It's a little harder than photo because I remember when we were starting out, we could go just shoot like an engagement session of a couple of friends or anyone we know or offer it for free. It's a lot easier with photo. Just kind of pick up the camera and go shoot a couple and you can start testing out ideas and, seeing what works and what doesn't work and things like that. Video, it's definitely trickier, isn't it? It's like, you have to kind of like either know someone who's getting married. Um, I think for people starting out, it's perfectly fine to offer your services for cheap or free. Um, with the caveat that they weren't already going to maybe hire someone to do it. I mean, it, there is a responsibility aspect to this. Mm-hmm. So if they were just going to go photo and just definitely not hire video, I think it's like appropriate or okay to hop in and say, Hey, could I, could I try making something for you here? Like, is that, would that be cool? Because they weren't going to get anything done anyway, but, yeah. uh, falsely kind of advertising that you can do video. If someone's relying on that, um, mm. I think ethically starts to get a little dicey, right? You don't want to, you don't want to jump into that and ruin their day. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think with video, it's a, just a little trickier in that regard. But there's plenty yeah. of people that don't do video, as you know, um, people that just mm-hmm. forego video. And so if you're starting out, you can find friends, cousins, you know, someone you know, a, a photographer who, um, 
who uh, is shooting a wedding that they're not having video that doesn't mind having you tag along. Mm-hmm. Now it's, it's a slow start and it takes a while to compound. So that's the tricky part. It's like yeah. you book something and it's like a year from now. And then, you know, another three to six months after that until you can like actually do something with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, just getting out there and trying to shoot as much as you can early on is, is by far the biggest thing. Business wise, I mean, our our whole thing has always been we focus a lot on trying to get leads to come in uh, from as many different sources as possible. Mm-hmm. So right now, I couldn't even tell you what our single biggest source of leads is because it's so evenly spread out, very much intentionally um, mm-hmm. between uh, planners venue recommendations, past clients, uh, friends who um, uh, uh, knew someone who got married and saw it, like social media posts, um, publications. Um, So I would say don't put your, uh, sometimes a little bit now vendor listings, although that that used to be more of a thing when we were starting out. Now is definitely dwindled, I think, because it gets so saturated with so many people. You know, there's like a hundred people on this, uh, wedding blog, uh, listing, uh, directory or whatever. Um, (laughs) how how are you supposed to get, how are you supposed to stand out? Even if you're like the best person in the bunch, like how do you, you know, one way is they want to get more money from you. Right. And they promote you and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I've heard some people have success with that, but I've also heard an equal amount or more have terrible, uh, uh, you know, kind of results. So, Mm. um, yeah, I mean, so so on the business side, I would just say like you're spreading out as many different ways as you can. Maybe the one way we've never really tackled hard is SEO. I'm not saying don't do it. I think like some people have really good success with that. It can work really well. Um, it just happens to be that we've not done that. Um, yeah. and we do, we do like a little bit with like with our website or stuff and stuff, just making sure a couple things are tagged or whatever in a post, but very minor. Um, mm. but again, not because I don't think it works, uh, yeah. just because I'm spread so thin doing all many other things, <laughs> um, to try to get work. So, um, yeah. yeah. On the business side, that would be the big, the biggest thing I would say is just get those lead generations up and, um, that that's going to allow you to be more selective with your clients, raise your prices, mm. uh, expand your team. These are all these are all things that are going to give you that longevity in this career, in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, that's generically kind of what I would what I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got a hypothetical for you, Ryan. Say, yeah. say you got a member of your team, right? And they're getting married in a couple of years. But they've asked you to film their wedding. Hypothetical, yeah. of course, of course. Would you charge, or <laughs> or would you be nice and do it for free, even though you'd probably rather be at the party as a guest, getting right. drunk? What what would right. your hypothetical answer to, the, to this be? Um. I would probably, I would probably tell them if I wanted to just be a guest or if I wanted to help them. So it's very situational. Mm. What was if you um, said, what, what, what was if you did that and they said, ah, uh, but my, my potential wife really wants you. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Boy, I feel like I'm being thrown into a, uh, a, a fiery situation here. No, no, no um, I'm, just, I'm just joking around. I'm just joking around. It is tricky though. It I is. Think, but there is the element of like friends asking and things like that. Um, you know, uh, actually like uh, one of our shooters over on the After It All side is uh, getting married and they, um, we are going to do something kind of interesting where I'm probably going to shoot part of it and another shooter on our team is going to shoot another part of it. Oh, We're going to okay. kind of flip flop mm-hmm. and that way we get a little bit of both. It's also very, very, very small wedding. Like I don't even know if we would be invited if, if it, if we weren't shooting it. So mm. it, it's a, just a tricky situation, but um, 
Yeah. I mean, t- for us, like at least with our studio, just because we've known everyone for so long, I, there's no way I could charge for it. Mm. Um, just, it's just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't feel right. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, it's, uh, not to say that that's the situation for everyone, but, um, yeah, it's tricky. Those, those problems are tricky. We don't get to attend many weddings these days, do we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, I mean, we get to shoot them of course, but like, uh, you never, you don't get to be a guest, uh, <laughs> because you might have a friend who got married, but you're already booked that day and you can't get out of it or something. Mm. Right. So. So yeah. it's yeah. tricky. Yeah. Plus we're getting to that age. I mean, not to age us all here, <laughs> Taurus with the same brush, but some of your friends, a lot of them are already married. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, you're, you're getting past that point, which is yeah. very, yes. very sad. Yeah. So, no more, no more, uh, no more weddings for us in terms of invites. <laughs> They've definitely dwindled. I have noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah sad so in wrapping up do you have any book recommendations for our listeners book yeah like whether it's a business book or yeah it's a mm. photography book or something my books that i read tend to be very uh i, I tend to read like non-fiction sciencey books so they're not they're not in the realm of uh all right they're not usually in the realm of like uh uh well i will say there was a uh, Let my people go surfing by Yvonne Chouinard was quite excellent. Right. Um, he's the founder of Patagonia, oh, and okay. um, right. yes, he he had some really wild uh, ideas about business and how to run a business back in the day that I think are still kind of being um, digested <laughs> by business leaders now. And there's a lot of people. There's like a lot of people that I think are. Um, kind of writing in his, on his coattails there a little bit. Um, and, uh, so that, that was, a, that was an interesting book, just how to lead a company and di- different ideas he had about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many would be other, <laughs> other recommendations I would have that would be like super relevant to, uh, to your listeners. But, um, yeah, that one, that one was, uh, very, uh, memorable for sure. Sounds like a good one. I might check it out myself. Yeah, I've actually that's yeah. slipped slipped my net actually. So I, well, do you want to buy it on the Audible Cinema account and then we can if, both enjoy if there's it? There's an audio version. I will. Yeah. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, I think there. I think there is. Yeah, yeah, I'd recommend it. Excellent. Well, definitely get that. Um, Ryan, thank you very much for joining us uh, for for our one hundredth episode. Yeah. Man, uh, I feel honored. Thank in the you. Air horn. <laughs> it's there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> where where can people find you online if they're interested in checking out your work? Yeah, I mean, you know, our wedding works uh at uh you know forge at Forge the North on Instagram and then forgethenorth.com. That's gonna be like our, our main wedding uh stuff. Um, unfortunately I don't, I'm terrible about posting my personal work on, um, on Instagram. I, I don't think I've made a post in four years, but, uh, if people wanted to check out any of my, uh, other commercial work, it's Ryan R Brown with an E on the end, Ryan R And so, cool. yeah, that's some other work that I've done there. So, yeah. Very cool. Definitely go check that out. And people can find us at perspectivebycinemate.com on Instagram at perspectivebycinemate. Like I said, if you like this conversation, you can join us on YouTube if you're not already watching and uh, hit that subscribe button just to um, boost the numbers. Since we've moved to this new platform, we need all the help we can get. And I, I, I will beg. I will beg. It's not below me. So yeah, hit that subscribe button. Um, Thank you for su- supporting us. I've lost my words. With Jack, thank you. Um, you have been a fantastic sponsor over the years. Um, and yeah, again, if you like this conversation, join us on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We hope to see you in the next episode. However, in the meantime, enjoy your life. <laughs>